a statement about the comparison of life with oxygen. And then photosynthesis is the next level, so I'll at least start there. Uh, exam three will still be on Friday. So we should start with carbon dehydrogenase, which is starting to gas and cycle. We'll include up through a decent phase. So we'll finish that the first part today, and then nothing else from today will be. So that means that to the extent that I start photosynthesis today, I will not be using normal perils of light with oxygen, which I will not say. Uh, I, I pose a few, a small number of sample questions, and I posted the answers today. Uh, of course, the old exams are there. Um, bring a calculator. So the review session um, will be tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock. I'm still not exactly sure where. I'm hoping we'll be, uh, I'm hoping we'll be in this room. And I think it's possible it will be, but I will have to let you know. I hope I'll let you know by this afternoon. Um, otherwise, it might be an online. Well, all right, how many prefer in person? <coughs> how many prefer online? Does that mean six pounds in town? Um, my hands get very tired. <laughs> All right, I want to finish this issue of why is it you said they so common. Um, so, putting aside the fact that it has to enable protons to get across the membrane, we're, we're not really addressing that, we're thinking more about just this, this rotational catalysis mechanism. Uh, where we have these different conformations, open, loose, and tight, and we have the gamma subunit rotating and causing a subunit that's in the tight conformation to switch to the, sorry, switches to the O conformation, right, et cetera. Right, so the question was, um, you know, this was the first question we did last time. I asked what was the thermodynamics and KD for this Binding reaction, binding ATP, and we all calculated that. Oh, this this, third, this uh, free energy diagram, and the, the answer was that the delta G is very large and negative, minus 61 kilojoules per mole. So a very large negative number and a very large, uh, well, very small KD. Remember that a small KD means uh, high high affinity binding or tight binding. And right, so those are the numbers that go with this. this big so this, this diagram sort of indicated that there's a very large free energy difference between ATP bound to the enzyme and ATP and the enzyme free solution. So what's the problem with this? So the problem with this, or so you know, what, what's the what's the good news about this? Remember, the good news is that this very tight binding to ATP enables this equilibrium constant to be greater than one, whereas in the absence of enzyme is a very, very small number. So that means that the equilibrium in the active side of the enzyme actually favors ATP as compared to ATP phosphate. Okay. So that you know, enables the enzyme to make ATP in a more efficient way than the so What's the problem? Um, the problem is uh, that the enzyme is binding very tightly to the product of the reaction. So let me, um, let's think about this. This is sort of the, the, the the problem with this is we're talking about this binding reaction. And the KD dissociation constant number is defined as the concentration of free enzyme, concentration of ATP divided by the concentration of the enzyme ATP complex. But the other thing about it is, you may recall that equilibrium constants are also the ratio of rate constants. So the binding step, let's call the rate constant for that step k on, because it's the rate constant for ATP getting onto the enzyme. So it's a lowercase k, it's a rate constant. And the rate constant for ATP dissociating from the enzyme, we'll call it k off. And it turns out that kd is equal to the ratio of K off to K on. 
So what I want us to do, and this was my second clicker question, but I'm not going to do it as a clicker question. I'm just going to show you the answer. It's sort of kind of a simple one. Um, but I mean, the issue that's uh, implied by that free energy diagram is that payoff is going to be very small. If KD is a very, very small number, then KOff is very small. So what I'm going to suggest on this slide is I want us to calculate a value of KOff. Right? We have a value of KD. If we, if we knew K on, we could calculate KOff. Right? So I don't know what K on is, but K on for ligands binding to enzymes is typically on the order of or greater than, could be greater than. So let's assume this value for K on. Ten to the six per molar per second, it's a second order rate constant, and that's a, a, a typical value for proteins binding the ligand. It could be greater than that, but it can't be. It can. It can't be much greater than about ten to the eight. It turns out ten to the eight is perhaps an atom. I chose ten to the six um, as a sort of representative number to use. If you if you make k on equal to ten to the six, then what's the value of k off? So k off is going to be k on times k d, which we're going to assume that k on is ten to the six per molar per second. K, k d is what is it? One point eight times ten to the minus eleven. And I'll put molar as the unit of KD. And so if you if you do the calculation, what you find is that this would mean that K off is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds. Uh, seconds to the minus 1. So that's a rate constant. That's a small value for a rate constant. Remember, a small value means slow reaction. So that's a very slow reaction. So that's the problem. The problem is that because the enzyme binds so tightly to the reaction, uh, the product of the reaction, it takes a very long time for that product to come off the enzyme. How long does it take for the product to come off the, off the enzyme? Well, we can make another sort of approximation, which is also a pretty good approximation. The time that's required for a reaction to occur, to occur is very close to the reciprocal of the rate constant. Okay? So the bigger the rate constant is, the smaller the reciprocal is. Right? The bigger the rate constant means a small amount of time is required for the reaction. So let's take this 10 to, uh, 10 to the minus fifth. Let's address this question. If K off is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5th seconds, how many hours would it take for ATP to get off the inside? So the time required for ATP associate from the enzyme is approximately equal to 1 over k off, which is equal to 1 over 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth seconds to the minus 1. Alright, so uh, that's equal to 5.6 times 10 to the fourth seconds. So it takes 56,000 seconds if these numbers are correct. So how many hours is that? Uh, there's 3,600 seconds in an hour, so it's 15 hours. That's the problem. You can't wait 15 hours for the ATP to come off the end. Um, now, of course, I use 10 to the 6th. Maybe it's 10 to the 7th. So then it's only one and a half hours. Or maybe it's 10 to the 8th, then it's only 0.15 hours, which I don't know what it is, 6 minutes or something, right? It's still too long. It has to be milliseconds, right? So the problem 
is all right. So here's this was this was going to be a quick question, but again, it's not. But given those numbers, there's the answer. Um, and so again, if we look at the free energy, yes. Is that supposed to say seconds or seconds to the negative? Uh, this is seconds to the minus one because this is the, the rate constant value. And the units of this rate constant is reciprocal seconds. It's a first order rate constant. And those are the units of a first order rate constant. But because you're taking the reciprocal, the reciprocal of seconds of minus one is seconds. So that becomes seconds. Yeah. So I just I just put, plug I want to take the reciprocal of that, so I just plug in the value of that. So, and I, yeah, I didn't fill the minutes. Why do you take the reciplical of K off? Um, because as I said, I don't, we'd have to, um, but I, I'm not sure I can even justify it now, but the reciprocal of the rate constant tells you how long the schedule takes, right? It's very close to the, again, a large, large rate constant means fast reaction, which means it doesn't, work. it turns out it's very close to the result. It's not precise. Other questions? All right, so here's a figure from the book that uh, was used to illustrate this point, and I looked at it, and I'm not sure how to really interpret it. So I re re redrew it. So this is the figure that um, I would use to illustrate this sort of uh, typical enzyme. And this is this sort of hypothetical ATP synthase that I talked about last time. So this is the energetics of a typical enzyme where this axis is the free energy in this x-axis, just in the case of progress of the reaction. And I drew it this way, and now we can put um, the different uh, components. So we're starting with enzyme, ADP, and phosphate solution. The enzyme binds to ADP and phosphate, and you get a, you know, maybe the free energy goes down a little bit, but not very much. Um, to make ATP, you have to get over this, this activation barrier. So there's some transition state to get from ADP and phosphate to ATP bound at the active site of the enzyme. And then uh, the ATP would have to be released. Right? So this is what you might expect for a typical enzyme. And I mentioned there are a lot of enzymes that catalyze, catalyze this reaction. Most of them do, that, do it in this way. So binding to ADP and phosphate is of moderate affinity. Binding of ATP is also of moderate affinity. So the equilibrium constant in the enzyme greatly favors ADP and phosphate. This, is, this would be an ATP synthase that doesn't work very well. Right? Most enzymes, if you mix them with these things, will, the net reaction will be the enzyme will bind ATP and hydrolyze it. Right? And it's, you know, they're, they're not going to make very much ATP. So ATP synthase um, sort of addresses this problem by, as we said last time, the free energy of the enzyme ATP complex is very low. It's much lower than you'd expect for a typical enzyme, right? So it's actually at slightly lower free energy as in my picture from the last time. So the enzyme binds ADP and phosphate with moderate affinity, and then it can make it into ATP because it binds ATP with very high affinity. But the problem is you've got this very high barrier that to get from this very stable enzyme ATP complex to ATP in solution. Right, so there's there's the other components of this. So that's a very high energy barrier, which implies a slow reaction. So that's of course that's the problem. The good news is that by binding tightly to ATP, you can make ATP more stable than ADP in the active site of the enzyme. The bad news is that the ATP won't come off the enzyme. Right? So why does this enzyme have to be have to be so complicated? Here's here's the way I would answer. Getting after the last 30 minutes is we've got this enzyme ATP complex. This is the type conformation. The type conformation means that ATP is bound tightly to much lower free energy than the ATP in solution. So what the enzyme has to do is there has to be some way Stabilize. Do you miss it all? The tight so conformation. You missed that first word. Yes. And so the answer, in my mind, how does how does the enzyme? Oh, 
Before I get to that, I just, just remind you, have more rules of how enzymes work. I don't know if this is really rule number 17, but one of the rules, the other, one of the other rules about how enzymes work is they don't bind tightly to their reactions of products, to their substrates of products, right? And um, if you recall the, the nice analogy in Biotech 461, chapter six, the stickase, so this is the reaction with no enzyme, and then the, the first sort of hypothetical enzyme, remember it's a metal stick, reaction is to break the stick, all right, here's the transition state where the stick is bent but hasn't quite broken, and then the product's a broken stick. And you recall that a very poor enzyme is one that is set up to bind very tightly to the, in this case, the, the substrate. But, so the substrate fits in perfectly, but the transition state does not. And so this was a very poor enzyme. This was the figure to indicate that. In this case, there, it's, it's you know, a high barrier to get from the ES to EP. So, um, so enzymes don't bind their substrates extremely tightly, nor do they bind their products very tightly, because that just makes their reactions slower. So this, this is, uh, ATP synthase is sort of an example of this, I would say. Uh, all right, so ATP synthase, if it weren't for the gamma subunit, this would be a very poor enzyme. It would make ATP, but that ATP is stuck. Right? So how is it getting un unstuck? It gets unstuck by the rotation of the gamma subunit. And so there's something about the way the gamma subunit interacts <laughs> with the beta and alpha subunits that the rotation and the way, well, it's the way that beta is interacting when, it, when gamma rotates and bumps up against the, the tight subunit, it kicks it and somehow causes it to change the conformation of the open conformation and the ADP is released. Right? So ATP is released. All right? So rotation of the gamma subunit what does it do? It destabilizes the tight conformation. So I would say that's um, that's why you need this rotational method. So that's a good question. I don't really know the answer. Um, I don't know if you can look, if it's possible to sort of look at the structures, and I don't know if anyone's done that. You know, but yeah, there's, it's a good question. Uh, okay. Any other questions? As I said, um, that first 20 minutes might be on the aspects of my um, I'm going to say five minutes, maybe two minutes, of the perils of life of oxygen, and, and then we start the synthesis. And none of you will be on this. with oxygen life in the presence of oxygen. Oxygen is good because this reaction and other similar reactions have very large negative free energy changes. The number in the book I believe is minus 2840 kilojoules per mole and this provides a free energy as we saw last time to make 30 to 32 ATPs, and that's good. Okay, so that was the table that I showed. Um, all right, so aerobic metabolism, you get 30 to 32 ATPs per, per mole of glucose, and again, anaerobic metabolism, you get much less. So an organism that can only make lactate or, or ethanol, <coughs> So that's the good news. What's the bad news? Um, the bad news is that the electron transport chain, which involves this membrane, 
and we have NADH, which is carrying two electrons, and we're going to need two of them per one molecule of oxygen. So electrons get sent into the electron transport chain, and in complex four, complex four does a good job of the following reduction reaction. Complex four catalyzes O2 plus four electrons plus four protons to make two molecules of water. And so that reaction, that's fine. That, that's, of course, what we want like the electrons to do, and it's what we want oxygen to do. The problem is that occasionally, the electrons don't get all the way to complex four. And this is a picture from the book that shows this, which is that occasionally, so this is to represent a, a reduced coenzyme Q, which they should call it QH2. Occasionally, the electrons, rather than being given to complex three and then complex four, occasionally, this reduced coenzyme Q will just happen to react with oxygen. And so oxygen is a good at accepting electrons. So what's indicated in this picture is the occasional non-enzymatic oxidation of reduced coenzyme Q by molecular oxygen. So they're showing a product, this thing, O2 minus dot. That happens when one electron goes from QH2 to oxygen. Right? So you get that QH2 or QH semiquinone radical. And you get this thing called O2 minus dot. O2 minus dot is called superoxide. superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl radical are collectively known as reactive oxygen species. Or ROS. And uh, they have variable reactivities. Actually, hydroxyl radical is the really bad one. Because hydroxyl radical is extremely reactive. And it really reacts pretty much with whatever it encounters. But it reacts, it can react with DNA, probably RNA, protein, and lipids. And so it will cause various chemical reactions of each of these substances, and it changes their, their chemical structures and it changes their function. In particular, if it reacts with DNA, it can cause mutations in the all right, so this is something that's happening all the time. It's happening as we're all sitting here because we're all breathing oxygen. Um, it happens at a low level. These, these reactions aren't you know, not very fast. Um, and we have defense mechanisms that I was going to describe but not going to. But we do have enzymes whose job it is, to, for example, to react, to convert superoxide to less reactive things. I think we have an enzyme that makes superoxide into hydrogen peroxide and O2. We have an, other enzymes that react with hydrogen peroxide and destroy it. Um, I think the overall goal is to prevent hydroxyl radical forming. Right? So we, we, we are able to destroy these things, but nonetheless, um, there's always a little bit that escapes, and, uh, and therefore DNA gets damaged. Of course, we can repair damage DNA, et cetera. But these things happen at a slow rate. And, uh, it's thought that these oxidative processes uh, you know, have some relevance to diseases. This is a table from another book 
that lists uh, a number of diseases that I say are associated with free radical induced damage, damage to cellular components. Free radicals would include hydroxyl radicals. Yes. Would it anything to Yeah, so they say cervical, and I have. I'll put a box on cancer, I think cancer in general. Yeah. Um, diabetes, and I added aging, which is not really a disease. It's when you start aging. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the bad news, right? The good news is that we can make tons of ATP. The bad news is that we can kill us. So that's, that's all I was going to say. Oh, the other thing I was going to do is, I, you know, so we have all these antioxidant enzymes that work. Um, and of course, we all know what antioxidants are food, right? So supposedly these. <laughs> Um, various foods that are rich in antioxidants, well, that's why you can one. The hope is that by eating these things, they can also react with some of these things and make them into less reactive uh, products. So that's all I have to say. And uh, are there any questions? Okay. So I, I wanted to, um, to uh, move on to the next stop. And I think I'll probably just be able to kind of give a broad introduction to photosynthesis. Uh, and then we'll get into the details of it. Um, so photosynthesis is, is started in chapter 19. And the reason for it is that the, the photosynthesis process has a lot of parallels to electron transport and ATP synthesis, right, as we'll see. Um, Photosynthesis is continued in chapter 20 because in addition to the reactions of chapter 19, which involve visible light, there's the so-called dark reactions with Calvin cycle, um, which is the other, the other aspect of photosynthesis. So I'm going to spend most of the time on chapter 19 and may not have much time for chapter 20. But let's start with chapter 20. And um, what chapter 20... <coughs> So in chapter 20, um, if you think about photosynthesis, well, you think about, you know, it involves sunlight, but what I always thought about was that it involves taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and making it into things like glucose and other substances. On that slide, they're showing carbohydrates. Um, actually, the plant, a green plant, can take CO2 from the atmosphere and fix the CO2, fix the carbon, and make all the carbon-containing molecules it needs using that carbon from CO2. So um, the question is, how does it do it? Right, so here's a slide that I showed a while ago, um, this was back in the gluconeogenesis. So th this shows how you can, for example, start with lactate, make OAA, and then make glucose 6-phosphate, like glucose, et cetera. You can start with some amino acids, you can start with glycerol. And then what I added was what green plants can do, which is that green plants can start with carbon dioxide, and they convert it into 3 phosphoglycerate, which you recall is an intermediate in this pathway. So 3 phosphoglycerate is an intermediate and then they can make glucose 6 phosphate. And then plants want to make things like starch, sucrose, and cellulose. <laughs> so I'm going to start with just a little bit about how the plant does these reactions. So I'm going to I'm just say briefly how the carbon dioxide works. And I'll come back to it later in detail. But this carbon fixation reaction starts with or you could, you could say it starts with ribulose 5-phosphate. Right, so where, where did we hear about ribulose 5-phosphate? Pentose phosphate. Right? So what happens to ribulose 5-phosphate in the plant? Plants have an enzyme that converts ribulose 5-phosphate into this molecule, to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. So that reaction involves phosphorylation of carbon number one, and so that's going to require an ATP. That's the phosphorylation donor. So this is an, an enzyme that humans don't have, but plants have it. 
And now it's ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate that actually undergoes the reaction with CO2. So the details of the reaction with CO2 I will probably show later. But this has five carbons. CO2 is makes carbon number six. The CO2 is added, and then the molecule is broken in half. And you get 3-phosphoglycerate, which we call is this structure. And since we started with six carbons, and this is only three, you can actually make two of these. So with those two things, there are six carbons total. That's enough to make a glucose. Right? And it would be made by the gluconeogenesis pathway. Right? But of course, the plant can make everything it needs from CO2. Right? And um, only one of these carbons came from CO2. The other five came from ribulose 5 phosphate. So what the plant needs to do is to make glucose, but also regenerate the ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate. Right? So in fact, this is now a numbers game. It's sort of like what we did for the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. So let's, let's make the number of carbons work out. Right? If we're going to make a new glucose molecule using CO2 from the atmosphere, we're going to need six carbons from the atmosphere. So we need six CO2s. So that means we need six of these to give us six of these. We'll take the six of these guys plus these six. That's 30 carbons plus 36. We'll get, now rather than two, we'll get 12 of these. So let's make this 12. Uh, and we'll have to use six ATPs. Okay. So we've used six ATPs, but now we've made 12 of these things. We have 36 carbons sitting here. And that's enough <coughs> carbons to make one glucose. That takes away six. And we can use the remaining 30 to regenerate this. Okay, so we, now the, the number of carbons is right. Okay, so doing this is a little bit complicated, but let me just take us through it. And let's first take two of these. And let's make, well, let's say we make glucose 6-phosphate. So we're going, to take, we're going to take two of these molecules. So it's, it's gluconeogenesis. So if you follow the pathway of gluconeogenesis, if you remember that, uh, we have to make 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So we need to use two ATPs. Right? And then we need to make glycerolate-3-phosphate, so we need a reducing agent. It turns out the reducing agent plant is going to be NADPH. And we need two of those. All right, so we're starting to use some, we're using some more ATP and some, more, and some NADPH. And that'll give us glucose. So we've taken two of the six, or two, sorry, two of the 12 three carbon molecules and made glucose out of it. Meanwhile, we have to take these <coughs> use the other 10 regenerate the ribulose 5-phosphate. So this, this is the so-called Calvin cycle. And it's very similar to the non-oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. It's actually a little more complicated. But a lot of the steps are exactly the same. And just as we didn't really do the non-oxidative phase in detail, we're not going to do this in detail either. But remember that for the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway, if you're going to make this, <coughs> remember what you start with? Okay. If you're going to make ribulose 5-phosphate, you're not going to, we didn't make it from that exactly, but we made it from things that we can make from that. It started with glycerolide 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. So if we can make this into those things, 10 of these, we can do it. We can, but it's going to take 10 ATPs. Because we're going to have to 
make these things into glycerolic, one three bisphosphoglycerate. And then we're going to have to make some glycerolic three phosphate and then fructose six phosphate. So we're going to need another 10 NADPH. So if you add it all up, and if I did it right, I think I did. Here's the point. This carbon fixation, by which I mean the way the plant takes CO2 and makes glucose, let's say glucose 6-phosphate, or which then you know, sucrose, whatever it's going to make, starch. You need lots of ATP and lots of ADPH. So this is what I said in class. We're talking about a biosynthesis pathway. And so we're talking about this part, anabolism, biosynthesis. We need energy and we need reducing agents. So in this what we're talking about is taking CO2, which for us is a waste product, but for plants is food. And this plant is going to take CO2 and make it into carbohydrates. So it's a biosynthetic pathway. You need a tremendous amount of energy, and you need reducing agents. So where is the plant going to get all this ATP and all these reducing agents? So this process, the so-called Calvin cycle, is also known as the dark reactions of photosynthesis. And they're called the dark reactions because light is not required, not because they happen at night. But it's where we get the ATP, it's the light reactions that enable a plant to make ATP and reduce NADP to NADPH. Okay? So here's a simple picture from the book that shows the carbon assimilation reactions, what they mean is taking CO2 from the atmosphere and fixing it into some carbohydrate in the plant, and to do that you need ATP and ADPH. Okay? Um, and so it's so the rest of the cycle or the rest of the process is the light reactions are what enable the plant to make an ADPH and make ATP, and that can be used for, for all the biosynthesis to do. So I'm going to spend most of the time on the light reactions, as I said, and maybe spend a little bit of time on the dark. Um, so the light reactions reactions involve the following two things. Uh, as indicated on the slide, one part of the light reactions is to take NADP plus and reduce it to NADPH. So you need two electrons to do that. So where do those electrons come from? As indicated on the slide, the reducing agent is water. The source of the electrons to make the <coughs> pH ultimately is water. So is water a good reducing agent? And that table of reduction potentials, where is water? Is it near the bottom or near the top? It's, it's at the top. Water is a very poor reducing agent. A very weak reducing agent. Right? The other product is oxygen. So what, what happens is we take electrons out of the water the water becomes oxidized to oxygen, which to a plant is a waste product, right? And electrons, you know, you could say electrons are going like this. Right? Electrons are going from water to the pH. Okay? So the first thing is we've got this very weak reducing agent, so we need to make, we need to somehow enable us to get electrons out of the water. That's what the light does, right? So the energy of the sunlight essentially is, a, is used to sort of get electrons out of water. You could say this. <laughs> but that's why we need the sunlight, because this is otherwise such a poor reducing agent. Um, the electrons are transported 
from water to NADPH by an electron transport chain. It's a different, it's a different set of molecules than in mitochondria, but in some ways it's similar. It's the same sort of overall concept. So electrons are passed from a series of electron carriers until they eventually reach NADPH. Or NADPH. And in the course of that electron transport, protons are pumped across a membrane. And so now you've got a excess protons on one side of the membrane, which allowing those protons to flow back in provides free energy. And so proton flow back <coughs> into the membrane has negative free energy and use that to make ATP. And the ATP synthesis is an ATP synthase that's essentially identical to the one in mitochondria. Right, so the ATP that's being made in this figure is being made using a proton gradient, which again arose because of this electron transport process. All right, so that's what I want to fill in, uh, mostly starting on Monday, is I'll spend a fair amount of time on the electron transport, and then not as much on ATP synthesis, because it's already basically done. Um, I think before I... The next thing I wanted to do was just uh, remind us that this all happens inside the world. So in green plants, this happens in chloroplasts. It's all also some bacteria. Let me just let's just review the terminology. So chloroplast is an organelle. It has an outer membrane. like the outer membrane of the mitochondria is very porous and isn't really, uh, doesn't really do anything that I'm aware of in this process, so we'll pretty much ignore that. Um, and then there's an inner membrane, but unlike the mitochondria, there's a third membrane, it's the third one that's important for the chloroplast. So, uh, all right, so the, the, the membrane that's relevant is in these sort of flat disks, which I'll draw like this. So the, this is called thylakoid. And so there's a, a thylakoid membrane, which is not really labeled, but it's these little stacked disks of thylakoids. So those have a membrane. And the electron transport occurs in that thylakoid membrane. And actually, the molecules that absorb sunlight are found in that membrane. And protons get pumped in this direction. So, anywhere. So, they go into these small chambers, right? The terminology is that. The, the sort of soluble region outside those little chambers, outside the thylakoids, is called the stroma. And the inside of these things is called the lumen of the thylakoids. And so the stroma is the P side of the membrane, because the protons, I'm sorry, it's the N side. Yeah. Because the protons are pumped you know, from the stroma into the lumen. And so the lumen is the P side of the membrane. So all the action is going to occur in this membrane and those two parts of it. So the lumen is sort of analogous to the matrix. So the stroma is analogous to the matrix. So when the protons are getting back from outside the stroma, that's where the free energy Yeah, so the yeah, protons are pumped in, and then when they flow back out, that's where the is. So the stroma is like the, what I just said. OK, so. Pardon me? 
<laughs> um, so maybe I'll uh, I'll just mention an experiment that's described in the book. Oxidation is you know, a substance that's going to lose an electron and become oxidized. Photoxidation means that it loses the electron in response to the light. So there was an experiment done in 1937 by someone named Robert Hill. And um, it's just a sort of interesting experiment to think about. So what he did is he took an extract of leaves. And uh, I guess he, I guess it had chlor chloroplasts. And so let's let's assume he has chloroplasts, or he has a solution that contains chloroplasts. And if he shined light on this, nothing happened. Uh, there's no well, yeah, not much, not much really happened. But if he added this substance. Those of you who had a chemistry set when you were a kid, maybe you had a chemistry set. Maybe they don't do this anymore. And this is called ferrocyanide, ferrocyanide. And it has an iron plus three, so that's an oxidized iron. If you add this, and it's the iron plus three that's important. If you just put that in, nothing really happens either. But if you, sh but then when he shined light on this, in the presence of this ferrocyanide, what happened? Oxygen was produced. So I'm not sure this experiment tells you what's going on, but I think in retrospect we know what happened. What happened was <laughs> that. The following set of redox reactions were happening. So the water was being oxidized, and the electrons were going from water not to NADP, because they didn't put in any NADP, NADP, but instead, the iron plus three, to make it balance was two of them, was accepting the two electrons and giving you iron plus two. Yeah. And so all you needed was an electron acceptor. And that was that enabled electrons to be taken out of the water, be transferred to the electron acceptor. And that led to the production of molecular oxygen. But that reaction required light. Right? So it's an oxidation water, oxidation of water, but it only occurred in the presence of light. Right? So the question was, starting in 1937, is what's in this mixture that enables this reaction to happen? And we're not going to worry about this, because that's artificial. But for us, the question is, how can we take electrons from water and give them to NADP, give them to NADP and how does the light enter? Okay, so I've used up all my time, fortunately, and so next time I will start on the uh, specifics of this. Uh, I will send an email about the review session later this afternoon. <laughs> I don't think